you for that introduction. Um, I, my name is Laura Syrak Schaefer. I'm the Grants Program Coordinator for the UNC Wilmington's Marine Quest Program. And I get to run our current grant program, which is called Turtle Trash Collectors. So today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit how we, about how we've gone virtual. So we've taken a hands-on classroom simulation and turned it into an engaging digital experience in response to COVID-19. Our funding for turtle trash collectors comes from the No Marine Debris Program, and we are very grateful for that funding. And during our turtle trash collector programs, it's our goal to educate youth about the impacts of marine debris and try to encourage some behavior changes to reduce the amount of marine debris that is generated in the future. We focus our efforts on underserved rural communities, and you'll see that when we were doing in-person programming, that was really focused in southeastern North Carolina. One of the silver linings of going virtual is we've actually had a worldwide reach with turtle trash collectors. And I'm going to show you some maps of that later so you can get an idea of where participants are joining us for our programs. During today's presentation, I'm going to talk to you about a typical day of in-person programming talk about our public programs that we've attended, as well as cleanup events that we've hosted. And then I'll talk about how things changed about a year ago and how we've adapted our program to the virtual platform. We will also cover some virtual resources that we created during the virtual COVID times that we are in. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about some of our assessment findings if we have time. So this is what a typical day of school programming looks like. Usually myself and my co-instructor meet really early at the program van. We drive out to a school, usually within two hours of Wilmington. So sometimes it's a lot of driving in a day. And when we get to a school, we set up their classroom or their space to look like a science lab. Students get the opportunity to participate in a simulated necropsy or animal dissection using our modified plush sea turtles like you're seeing on the screen. I'll show you a little bit about how they're modified in a couple of moments, um, but you can see that these students gear up with personal protective equipment and they also use different scientific tools during the program to make it as realistic as possible. We talk with the students about what a simulation is and why we're going to do our necropsy today to learn about how this sea turtle died so that they can find out ways that they can help make a difference for sea turtles and the ocean in general to help keep our whole planet a little cleaner and safer. A couple of those scientific tools that we use include a data sheet. So this is the one that we use. I modified it from a real sea turtle necropsy data sheet to make it a little bit more kid friendly and easy to fill in during our programs. And we also use a dichotomous key during the program. One of the first things we do is figure out what species of sea turtle we have. And we go through this key with the students so they can start turning on their science brain and making observations on our turtles. Now, during the uh, activity, the students do an external examination, but then they also get to go inside of our turtle too. So this is where it has been modified. So externally, our turtles, they measure the turtles to figure out at the age. They look for any barnacles or slicing wounds or bite wounds or entanglements. And some of the turtles are entangled in different materials on the outside. But then when they open up the turtles by taking off that bottom shell, the plastron, they really get to see some of the impacts of marine debris. So we dive deep into the inside of these turtles, specifically looking in their digestive system to see what the turtles were eating. And the students find that the cause of death for these turtles is marine debris. And here's an example of some of the stuff that they might find inside of the turtles. We are really using this powerful moment, this power of simulation to help the, turtle, the, the students experience a sea turtle necropsy firsthand so that they can really see the impacts of this marine debris. And this simulation is powerful. You can see on our screen over here, this student is grossed out by looking on the inside of our turtle. Sometimes they pretend like it stinks or they gag. It's really entertaining with every single group of students because everyone has a different reaction to what they think they're going to see and then what they actually see inside of our turtles. Now, after we do the simulated necropsy, we do our wrap up, which is the most important part of the program. We talk to students about how trash makes its way to the ocean by traveling through our wind and our rain into the drains and the 
the waterways to get to the ocean and how animals in the ocean can mistake that, that trash for their food. We use that teaching tool as a really important way to get students, to make students feel empowered. We want them to know that we can all help stop marine debris. And we focus on three main things that students can really connect with and identify with as things that they can do. So those things include picking up trash and becoming a turtle trash collector. And what I mean by that is that we want them to join our digital badging program. So we have these different digital badges that students can earn just by going out and picking up trash in their neighborhood. And when they pick up that trash, they're able to earn their badges and eventually become a turtle trash collector hero. But that's just the first thing we share with them that they can use or they can do. We also talk with them about using reusable items instead of disposable ones. And we give them tangible examples of easy switches they can make in their own life. And then we talk to them about the importance of spreading the word and telling other people about this issue, because the more people who know are the more people who can help. Now, through our in-person programming, we reached nearly 12,000 students during January 2019 until March of 2020. Most of these students were third, fourth, and fifth graders. That's the age group that we were targeting. And you can see a map of where those schools were. So you can see a lot of dots out here in more of the rural areas. And again, we were focusing on underserved schools as much as possible. Now, I also want to mention that a lot of these dots do represent multiple trips to the same school. Since we were targeting third, fourth, and fifth graders, we would go multiple days to see all of those students, and then sometimes we would go back in multiple years to see the students who are now third, fourth, or fifth graders during that program time. So we really enjoyed doing all of this in-person programming. In addition to school programs, though, we also did public programs. A big place that we were at for public programs is the Sea Turtle Hospital, or the Karen Beasley Sea Turtle Rescue and Rehabilitation Center in Surf City, North Carolina. During the summer, normally, when we're not in COVID times, they have a lot of visitors come to their center to see the sea turtles. And so what we did during that first summer of 2019 is set up a tent right outside and had our turtles there as an opportunity for youth and families to come and learn more about sea turtles while they were there and also to really see those impacts of marine debris. Um, during these, we did a lot of other public programs too, and you can see a lot of our partners here on the screen. Um, a lot of these public programs were really, really important and really valuable because it gave us a chance to connect not only with those youth, with the little, with the students, but also with their parents and with families or with older participants during these public events. And that really gave us a chance to help make a bigger difference because sometimes the students who might be third, fourth or fifth graders, they might not have control about what they purchase at the grocery store or how their lunch is packed. But if we're able to connect that information back with their families, we can really help to make a big difference. So these were invaluable opportunities to talk with those families. In addition to doing our in-person um, events and programs, we were also hosting cleanups. We had intended to do this all over our um, area that we wanted to reach during the program, including further inland, um, but unfortunately COVID stopped that. So here you can see where the seven cleanups we were able to host were, and they were all along the coast. A lot of these we, uh, we um, promoted during those public events. So if we had a public event that was at the aquarium at Fort get submitted through the marine debris tracker app and we had 54 volunteers at these programs connect or collect almost 2,000 pieces of trash which was over 135 pounds you can see some of the amounts and the weights of the trash here on our graph um, and a lot of the places where we found more trash was really because we had more volunteers at those particular cleanups especially this north topsail beach cleanup we had a lot of people at that particular one we found a lot of different items during these cleanups. You can probably see some very common items that you probably find during your cleanups as well. So cigarette butts, plastic pieces, and food wrappers were really the ones that we found, the items we found the most often during these cleanups. 
All right, so, so far we've talked about our typical day of in-person programming, as well as public events and cleanup events. And now we're gonna switch gears and talk about how we adapted this program to the virtual world that we are living in. Because as you know, in March of 2020, things changed. When everyone went into quarantine and things closed down, we, just like everyone else, had to pivot our work completely online. And so we did this in consultation with NOAA. We talked with them and met with them about what we were going to do and some of the changes that we thought we needed to make. And they were so supportive of helping us continue with our work and making sure that we were reaching and or we were delivering the same messages and trying to still work within the spirit of the grant as we had originally written it, even though we had to change some things. So during our virtual programs, in order to change those up, I had to turn my garage into a studio or a lab. I've since moved into my guest room because it has been very cold in the wintertime, um, but we can see what the lab kind of looks like. We purchased some professional lighting as well as a cool backdrop and a webcam to really make these virtual programs as engaging and look as good as possible to keep our participants focused and engaged on what we were doing with them. This is what it looks like in action. So you can still see that we do that necropsy. We do an external and an internal examination. Um, we just have to do it for them instead of the students doing it uh, on their own. Uh, but when we do these, we are really adapting to whatever the teacher needs because all over the place, people are teaching in very different ways. Sometimes students are in the classroom watching on a smart board or on their own devices in the classroom. And sometimes everyone is virtual. So we've made it possible to connect with students no matter what their situation is. And the teachers are really appreciative of the opportunity to still do the program even though it is virtual. So during our virtual programs, our participants- Hold on, it got loud. All our participants are virtually participating in a simulated sea turtle necropsy, that animal dissection. They learn how the trash can get to the ocean, see how it impacts sea turtles when it's there, and learn how they can stop help stop marine debris. So you can see that the content of the program is still the same. It's just the delivery that is different. We use a lot of the same tools that we would use in the classroom and we've included a lot more pictures too to help make sure that we're keeping our um, participants engaged. And a, another cool thing that we use during the programs is polling to make sure that we're staying interactive and that we're able to ensure that our people on the other end of the screen are understanding and focusing. So this is an example of some of the polls that we would use within Zoom. So Zoom does have an awesome polling feature that we take advantage of, but we also do this program in Google Meet as well as Microsoft Teams if the teacher needs. And if that's the case, we kind of change these questions a little bit to be more thumbs up, thumbs down answers. Sometimes they show us numbers with their fingers or type in the chat. We use that chat to help people stay engaged and to take questions too during the program. Another uh, resource we created for teachers is a flip book. So we give the teachers the opportunity to use the data sheet that I showed you earlier or to use a flip book in their classroom. And if they choose the flip book, they cut along those dotted lines and then students can staple them together and follow along and record their observations during the program. So this is really popular if the students are in the classroom and were projected on their smart board. That way it keeps those students how they have something to do and something to fill in as they're going. A really cool thing that we've found as part of our, our virtual programming is an increase in the number of people who participate in the digital badging program. So we had hoped that this was going to be a huge, a big thing that a lot of people would participate in. We talked with over 12,000 students in person about it, um, but not very many people went home and signed up. Um, that's a kind of a long time to have to remember, okay, I have to go on the computer with my family and sign up for the badging program. And we find that a lot of people who do cleanups do it for intrinsic reasons. They don't need a digital badge to go out and pick up this trash. They wanna do it so that they can help the turtles. And that's really the goal, uh, but we like to see some of our our participants who are actually out there doing cleanups. And during the virtual programs, we actually go onto the website and show them exactly how to sign up and send them the link. And so we've gotten a lot more people sign up with that in that way. 
Um, and we talk with the students about how doing this digital badging program and going out and doing their own cleanups is something that they can do on their own and with their family. So they can do it while being socially distant during our COVID times. We've had over 900 participants awarded over 800 digital badges and have had 86 participants complete the program and earn their Turtle Trash Collector Hero Badge like you can see here. We also ask if they give us a photo for the program um, or for their cleanup. We ask if we can post it on social media. So the ones you're seeing are ones that said, yes, please post it on social media. And so we do that to encourage, to thank them for their efforts, but to encourage others to sign up or go out and do cleanups as well. Now I wanna highlight two specific schools that took what we did with our virtual programming and went beyond just that virtual program. One of those is Northwest Elementary School in Greenville, North Carolina. This is Mr. Fritz you're seeing here demonstrating their new refillable water bottle station at their school. So they actually had um, reusable water bottles donated for every single student in their school. And they are now using these reusable water bottle filling stations. Mr. Fritz, during this video that he did to show how it works, he brought, he reminded everyone of the Turtle Trash Collectors program and explained again why it's so important to use reusables instead of single use disposable plastic bottles. But Mr. Fritz did even more than that. They also did an upcycling activity where they took old t-shirts that were donated by staff or brought in by students and they turned them into bags. So this is an upcycling activity that we actually have in our handbook that we send to all of our participants uh, for the virtual programs and the in-person programs. Um, and so it's really easy just to take a pair of scissors and turn an old t-shirt into a reusable bag. They also did cleanups right on their school's campus. So they took the third, fourth, and fifth graders and they split them into different areas of their school's campus to collect debris. And you can see that they did two cleanups so far. So in green, we have their first cleanup in October. Blue is their second cleanup in November. I think they might've done another one. I just don't have the data for it yet. Um, and then some of the yellow, or all of that yellow is from virtual cleanups. So some of the students at this school are still learning completely um, virtually. And so they also participated and did some cleanups as well. We can see a lot of what they found are snack wrappers and packaging. So that's a big thing that they found on their school's campus. And other trash is mostly paper products. So paper cups, plates, as well as paper bags too. Another school I wanted to highlight is the Navari Beach Marine Science Center in Navari, Florida. And this group, we did a virtual program with them and they did a number of cleanups in conjunction with our citizen science project, which I'm going to introduce in just a second. During these programs, they collected over 2,500 items, 168 pounds of trash, including a lot of beach toys and face masks. So you can see this young lady has a bunch of face masks there in her hand. And we talk about the importance of making sure that we're disposing of face masks properly and even about why it's important to try and snip the ear loop from those if you are using a disposable one to try and keep the, our whole planet a little bit safer from those face masks that we have to use right now. Now, during our virtual programming, we have reached almost 5,500 people with school programs. And we've done that in 12 states, but also across the world. So you can see we've reached people in Puerto Rico, Austria, and India. If we look a little closer at the United States, we had one school in Hawaii, and we have another one coming up later this spring, which is really exciting. But we've reached a lot of people within the continent most of those are in North Carolina. So if we look a little closer at North Carolina, you can see we still reached a lot of people in our original area that we had outlined in our grant, but doing virtual programs has really given us the opportunity to spread the word, not only across the state and the country, but across the world, which is really an amazing silver lining of doing virtual programs. Now, in addition to those private or private virtual programs that we're doing for schools and small groups. We've also done a number of public programs. So we advertise these on our Facebook page, but we also have a bunch of amazing partners that have worked with us for these virtual programs. And you can see those partners here on the screen, some of which are here today with us. Um, and so we're really grateful for this opportunity because it lets us reach a larger group. 
So we've reached a lot of our own bubble, but by partnering with these other environmental organizations, we're able to reach additional groups all over the state. Most of these were within North Carolina, although we do have a group from Tennessee that we partnered with. And then I have another couple of 4-H groups from other states that we're working with this spring. If you're interested in checking out a virtual program, we have a bunch of public ones coming up. So I've listed them here. You can check out our website or Facebook for more information on those. Or if you have a network that you wanna do a program for, scouts, students, or even a network of adults, we're happy to work with you. So please, please reach out to me. Okay, so now we've covered our in-person programming as well as how we've switched to that virtual platform. The last two things I wanna talk about are some of our virtual resources that we created and those assessment findings that we have so far. So since we weren't traveling two hours a day to get to schools, we had a little bit of extra time on our hands. Not that much because as you can imagine, it changing everything changes the way that you have to market and the way you have to coordinate. Um, but we did have time to create some other things for for our participants and for our social media followers. One of those were a number of upcycling activities. So during our last NOAA Marine Debris Program grant, which was turtle or traveling through trash, the 3T project, we had created a guide with links to different upcycling activities, which is when you're reusing something that you would usually discard and creating something more valuable out of it. And so we took some of those items, those things that we had linked to and recreated them to make our own version and to kind of create a how to make this guide. And so we would post these on our Facebook weekly and you can see a lot of things are made out of stuff you might have at home. And so we were hoping that this would be a good resource for families who were newly stuck in at home all the time with their kids um, and something to give them something to do during quarantine. We also created a couple of guides to help um, participants and the social media followers lead a more plastic free life. So one of the things we created was a plastic footprint guide where we asked this, the participants to figure out what their plastic footprint is, which means go in your home, specifically in your kitchen and your bathroom and look and see what's there. Look for the plastic items that are disposable, look for things that might be reusable and try to figure out if those items are really necessary. We provide some examples of switches that they can make. Some of them are ones that are pretty common and like the reusable water bottles and containers instead of plastic baggies. But we also mention things in the bathroom like using uh, bars of soap instead of gel soap in the shower, bamboo toothbrushes, and even those shampoo and conditioner bars that you can use for your hair. So we tried to help our, um, and we tried to think outside the box and give some really exa some examples that many people could pot potentially do in their homes. We also made a guide that focused more on lunches and packing lunches when um, people went back to work and back to school. So this is our zero waste lunch challenge, a guide to waste free eating, where we give specific examples of things that they can use that would be reusable rather than single use. And recognizing that we're focusing a lot of these efforts and this um, outreach on underserved areas, we also show or talk about linked to a couple of ways that they can make their own reusable containers. So you can actually take a milk jug and turn it into a reusable container that you can put your in and you can use old drink pouches to actually create little pouches for snacks. So these are really fun things that they can do as a family, but just some easy things to make switches in their lunches. In addition to doing those resources, we were also out in the community doing cleanups. So we couldn't host in-person cleanups due to COVID-19. Instead, we did what we called virtual or solo cleanups. Twice a week, we would head out to Surf City and Wrightsville Beach to collect trash. And we would post a video, a time-lapse video of that onto our Facebook page. So this is what that would look like. We'd show them the trash that we collected, give a little description of what we found, and talk about what's happening with sea turtles in the area during that time. So we would put the updated nest numbers and talk about whether it's mainly mama sea turtles coming up to nest, or once we got into the hatching time, we would talk about how the babies are hatching and heading to the ocean. And we did this as a way to try and remind people that that this trash is on our beaches. We have sea turtles coming up right now. We really need to keep it clean, not only for the beaches sake, but also for those sea turtles sake. 
During our virtual cleanups, I have some of the numbers of the trash that we collected. You can see it really did peak in July and August when we have a lot of people here visiting our beaches. And we did find more trash in general at Wrightsville Beach rather than Surf City. But the density of trash at Wrightsville was really higher because we were walking a smaller distance and collecting a large amount of trash. Whereas at Surf City, we would usually travel further, probably about a mile to collect a similar amount of trash. So that was really an interesting finding from our virtual solo cleanups. And a lot of the things that we found during these cleanups are things that I'm sure you have found as well. So cigarette butts, food wrappers, and plastic pieces. But we also found a lot of beach toys and discarded clothing items on the beach too. So that was really interesting. Now we did that, those virtual solo cleanups as part of our citizen science project. So one of the things that we wanted to figure out is were, what is the amount of litter in our community changing as a result of COVID-19? So we heard the stories about how there's less air pollution because people are staying home, the water is clearing in different areas. We wanted to know if that's having an impact on the litter in our neighborhoods and communities too. And to do that, we needed the help of the community to answer this question. So we created a citizen science project where participants can head out and create a route around their neighborhood that they would follow multiple times. They would do that during the beginning of the pandemic when they signed up and then we were hoping they would do it multiple times throughout the pandemic to see if things were really changing. We have all the details on our website and we really encouraged the data recording using the Marine Debris Tracker app. So that way all of that data was recorded and we did ask them to report it back to us. We didn't have as many people participate in this as we had hoped, but you can check out a little bit of the project data that we have from it. This is featuring Navari Beach cleanups here in green and then Northwest Elementary in teal and then any other group that participated is in blue. So those are the, um, the numbers that we had for our citizen science project so far. One last thing I'm going to share with you is a new initiative that we've just started, the After School Kids Mentoring Experience, or Ask Me for short. So we have an amazing UNCW student who is a mentor for students at um, after school centers in Southeastern North Carolina. And she's heading out there to engage the student population in marine science to show them that people, that anyone can really do this marine science work. And they're specifically doing hands-on cleanups at the site. So right now we've done our first cleanup at two different centers in Wilmington, the Martin Luther King Center and the YWCA. And we've collected over 300 pieces of trash during those first couple of cleanups. Now, most of the stuff that we're finding are things that um, a lot of students might use on campus or would be would have at their centers. So food wrappers, bottle caps, glass pieces, plastic pieces, and foam pieces. And we are extending this through the end of the grant period, which is ending in May. And hopefully we will add additional sites. And we're hoping that the Ask Me program is going to continue, even though our grant funding for turtle trash collectors is ending. Um, I know that I'm kind of over time, so I'm going to skip over this pre and post assessment You're thing. Okay. You can keep going if you'd like. It's going to take about five more minutes for me to get through this particular yeah, part. Good. Okay. Um, so one other thing that we, or one other thing I wanted to share with you was some of our pre and post assessment data. So with the grant, what we were doing is every teacher who participated, every student who participated, we asked them to do a short questionnaire before and after the program. Like everything else, this changed a little bit when we went virtual, we had to make it a lot shorter and quicker to complete. So what I'm going to show you is some of the data from the virtual programs, but we do have a whole bunch of data from in person programs too. So hopefully we'll be able to actually see how in person versus virtual programs are impacting our population, um, but we are not quite there yet. So to take a look at some of the things that we found, we wanted to see how often our participants use single use items. And we found that most of them use them sometimes or most of the time. Recently, we added a question to really identify when do you use those single use items? Because we wanted to be able to target those specific instances during our wrap up when we talked about reusables. So most of our participants were using them at home at school, on the go, or with takeout. So again, these are specific examples of ways that we can focus on those reusable items at home or at school or on the go. 
Now we also asked them when they used reusable items and most participants used them sometimes or most of the times and they identified reusable water bottles as something that they were using most commonly. After the program, we asked if they were likely, how likely they were to make a switch to reusables. And most participants were very likely or likely to switch. And we asked, or we gave them some examples of things, some changes that they could make to see what are they willing to change. And most people, again, identified those reusable water bottles as something that they could change and also using containers for snacks. So that was a really interesting way to see some of the things that they were more willing to make. And we wanted to include other things to give them an idea of some other ideas of things that they could do. So carrying reusable utensils, for example, so that they could refuse those single use ones when they go out. It's also important to note that a lot of this data is still from that upper elementary age group. So sometimes those students might not feel empowered to make those changes because it might not be up to them. So the fact that they picked these particular things is really interesting. Um, two other things I wanted to note about the assessment is that we were trying to see how willing people were to make a difference through cleanups in their neighborhood. So we asked beforehand during the pre-assessment, can litter in your neighborhood make its way to the ocean to gauge that knowledge beforehand? And most people did know that yes, litter in my neighborhood can get to the ocean, but we also asked them if they ever do cleanups in their neighborhood. This is before that program. And most of them did not do cleanups before the program. They either did them never or they did them every few So we're seeing that our program is having an impact on their mindset, on their hope, and their want to go out and pick up trash in their neighborhoods. And then we also asked them if they were willing to make a difference by spreading the word. And most participants were very likely or likely to tell other people about what they learned through the Turtle Trash Collector program. Some schools even took that a step further. And here's some example of artwork or posts that they created to kind of help spread the word at their school and in the community too. We also would share the um, NOAA Marine Debris Program's calendar contest with our groups too to try and encourage them to make submissions for that. And I think some of these students did submit their artwork for that co calendar contest. Now, as we are wrapping up the Turtle Trash Collectors Program, our funding from NOAA is going to end in May. And so we're looking for a lot of ways to extend the life of the grant beyond May. So some of the things that we're doing is creating a recording of the virtual program that teachers can use in the classroom and creating a teacher's guide with all of the resources that I shared with you and specific ways to incorporate it based on their own or their grade level that they're teaching. So we're going to tie it into all of the standards for or tie it into standards at each grade level. Um, this pro a lot of the teachers I've worked with for many years during this program and our last grant that we had. So they are familiar with the program and they'll be able to use that recording, pause it at strategic points during it to be able to have a discussion in their classroom to hopefully still have that impact and that reach even though the grant is going to be ending. Our digital badging program will still be available. It'll be all automated. So when someone requests their badge, it will pop up and they can download it immediately to their device. And then finally, we are creating a how to make a necropsy turtle guide. So we had a lot of requests to either purchase or to purchase our turtles or how to make their own turtles based on ours that we have. Um, and we did create them ourselves. Lots of hours of designing and sewing went into that. And so I'm trying to create a guide so that other people can read create their own turtles um, on their at, at their sites. So we're excited about that too. So I want to thank you for listening today. I've thrown up here some numbers that are cumulative over both the virtual and the in-classroom programs. And I'm really excited at the reach we've had so far. Um, and we do have a lot of schools and groups on the calendar through the end of May. And so I'm excited to see what we can do beyond just right now and see where we can go from here. So again, thank you so much for listening. Thank you to NOAA Marine Debris Program for our funding. And I'm happy to stick around for questions. I know that we're kind of over time. But. Thanks, Laura. Um, we will open it up for questions and we'll do a Q&A 
um, up until right about five till our next panel. So um, for those of you who are in attendance, feel free to unmute and break out some questions. I have a question if that's possible. Go hey, for it, Liz, how are you? Oh, I, I'm great. That was so fantastic and so, so impressive of, of a way. My question stems from the, about two years ago, Kathy Yoon and a group from the Seattle Aquarium came out to do an empathy kind of evaluation at the aquariums. Like how do we increase empathy in kids? And part of it is with animals. And so I'm wondering, if you saw any like any difference when you're able to use the turtles as a way of connecting to marine debris, like an empathy connection with kids versus when we just talk about marine debris and and because I think that's one of the most like from my like listening to what you did, um, that's such a powerful piece and it. I don't know. I, I just thought it was amazing what you did and I was trying to connect the two. So I'll just be quiet now. No, absolutely. That was a big part of writing the grant in the first place. So trying to connect with students using that kind of charismatic megafauna is a really big way that we were able to kind of relate to the students. So especially, you know, here in North Carolina, students and everyone really loves the sea, well, not everyone, but most people love sea turtles. And so using that as a connection is really powerful. And during our programs, um, during the introduction that we do, we really start by talking about that we're doing a simulation because when we go and tell them that the turtle is dead, it's sometimes not, sometimes we see a lot of reaction on the students' faces, especially depend, or especially if they're younger. So that's why we targeted third through fifth graders, but sometimes we would do a second grade class or a younger group. And so we really wanted to talk with them about the power of simulation and how we're using our imagination even though we're looking at a dead turtle today, the things we're learning from this animal that is not alive are going to help us make a difference for those animals that are alive. So we're using that as a really powerful teaching tool. And it is really, it is really powerful. Um, it, like I said, it's, it's amazing with each and every group that we are seeing, we see new expressions, we hear new things, we just, it just keeps it lively for us as well as for the students who are experiencing it first time, so firsthand. So it really is um, really drawing on their empathy and their love for the sea creatures. Thanks. Um, I see a question from Sarah in the chat. Um, these resources are going to be available for other groups. I am working very hard to try and finish up our guide for the grant. And so a lot of that will be available on the Marine Quest website. Um, our previous grants that we've had, we do have the reports and everything on our website too. So if you're interested in some of the other work that we've done in, regarding marine debris, it is available already. And so turtle trash collector stuff will be up there by May. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Hey, Laura, how can folks support this program and its efforts? So you mentioned that the funding is running out for this particular program. Uh, what can folks do to help support the program? I think that um, once the once that report is out there and once the resources are out there, helping us to share that with others is something that would be really helpful. Um, if you're willing to do something bet before May, we'd love to do a virtual program with your group. Or if you have, if you know of elementary, middle, or high school students who might be interested, spreading the word to the, some of those teachers would also be helpful. Um, we do have quite a few on the calendar for this month. Okay. 
always have there we can't go and have an event without at least one little technical glitch <laughs> so we are going to break now and we will be coming back here oh there you are laura <laughs> sorry <laughs> it's all right um i was just going to mention that this is our third um consecutive grant that we have on marine debris so we started with that traveling through trash one i came on to marine quest the marine quest team for ghost net busters which is our last grant that we had and then this is our most recent one so we are hopeful that there will be future funding to continue work like this usually we change it up a little bit to keep things interesting and also to um you know adapt and change for the topics that are most important right now so i am really grateful to be on a couple of the different subcommittees that i know we'll be talking during the next panel um, to help try and look at what we've got going on so far across the state and ways that we can improve or change or what gaps we need to fill in terms of education in the area. So we're hopeful that we'll still be able to do more work in the future on this topic. I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. Thanks, Laura. And we are grateful for the very creative work that you do. Um, and we appreciate having you here. Thank you so much. If there are any other questions, feel free to leave them in the chat or unmute. And we will be taking a very quick break and coming back here at 10 o'clock. Um, for those of you who are in the next panel, we are going to be working to allow you co-host capabilities and set you up spotlight about five minutes prior to beginning. So thank you so much. Good to see you, Laura. Good to see you guys Happy too. Happy Friday. Oh, wait, before, before we go to break, um, we have at least one birthday here today. So um, if there's if there's somebody here with a birthday, maybe maybe that person could um, could join us on screen, perhaps. I'm thinking Leslie Vegas if she's still with us this morning. I'm here. My camera is not working this morning, but I'm here. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's okay. It's your birthday. You don't have to be on camera. Happy birthday. <laughs> I'm snuggling in blankets on my desk, at my desk with my cats. That's <laughs> Thanks, happy, birthday. Yes, happy birthday. Thank That's you. Happening, but nobody wants that. That will be my gift to you, not singing. <laughs> um, but yes, thanks for being with us on your birthday. And happy Friday. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we will be back here momentarily. Thanks. <laughs> 